Hi, everyone. We're speaking with Drew Zimmerman, who's the CEO of Stallion Uranium. This is a technical story uh, from the Athabasca Basin, and it's uh, they've hit on a number of interesting conductive zones uh, and certainly things that we should be paying attention to. And although it is a tough market for juniors right now, this is a story that is hitting the, those technical aspects that people would like to see. Let's talk to Drew and drill this down into something that's a bit more palatable for the average retail investor to get excited about. So, Drew, uh, great to see you again. I had a chance to speak with you, uh, well, probably just at, at Metals Investor Forum and learned of the like the real technical aspects of this, why this is uh, the your maiden drill program was quite a success. And also that this is an opportunity for people looking at a Canadian homegrown Athabasca story uh, with with some early success. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, thanks for having me on and uh, the opportunity to share our story because uh, I think, you know, we deserve to be at the forefront of some of the exploration stories that are happening in the Athabasca Basin. We've got a huge land package and have done an incredible amount of work over the last year and a half and, you know, a very systematic, methodical process to try and make the next big discovery. You know, we think there's a Cigar Lake or MacArthur River in the western side of the basin and we're doing the work to, to find it and you know, to be honest, we need it. We need several more big world-class deposits to be found. And, you know, that's that's the work that excites us. And that's the work that we've been doing. So tell me, because I, I, there's a bigger conversation we're going to have just about that, uh, about, you know, this this the kind of nuclear renaissance, what that means for uranium, uh, as well as, uh, you know, I like to listen to like Justin Hune, who's, who's like the uranium guy. And he, he really thinks there's going to be a second wave here, a push that's that's coming. It's just, we've had a bit of a, uh, like a step back here. I, I think he's right. Um, and we're going to see a big spotlight on uranium again. But let's just look at the news release to, so that people can understand the significance of that that just came out uh, and where, like, what you've gathered from all the data to date that, that kind of makes you really fired up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we ran our first maiden drill program starting in March of this year. And, you know, we wanted to be transparent with the market. So as, you know, we sort of got each drill hole done, we put out, you know, the preliminary data from each hole. Um, so this news release that we just released this morning was, you know, taking a little bit of time to digest, you know, what this program gave us across all three holes. And because we are so near to Shea Creek, uh, the deposit owned by Uranium Energy Company in Rano, and we have all the, the public data that they have on that deposit, we were able to go through all of our data and really see how closely it compared in, in analog. So, you know, a lot of similarities to what they were seeing there um, and really be able to sort of extrapolate what we saw on, on a bigger scale and, you know, match up the geology. So what that allowed us to do, especially with, with hole three, again, all three holes hit anomalous radioactivity showing that the structure that we were drilling into the area, you know, is, is fertile for uranium, but hole three, where we hit a big graphitic structure, that's what you're targeting with the geophysical uh, targets that we had, you know, it gave us a lot of, of good information. One, we now know exactly where that structure is. That's the first thing. You're not just targeting, you know, geophysical anomalies anymore. It's specific uh, geological structure. We know now exactly where it is. You know, we know how it's how it's dipping, where it's moving. Uh, we're able to compare it to the structure at, at Shea Creek. And we also know that the structure is, is big. Um, so importantly, you always want to be looking for a system that has the potential to host a large deposit. So, you know, if you just have uh, a five meter graphitic structure, these graphitic structures are sort of the plumbing. Um, so if you think about, you know, a, a pipe going through your wall that's small versus a pipe that's big, you know, you can move a lot more fluid through that. And again, the potential to have much bigger mineralization. So at 95 meters of intercept of graphitic structure, we know this is, is big and as big, if not slightly bigger than the Shea Creek structure that's underneath those deposits. So with that, we're able to say, we now know where to target. We know this structure is fertile and we know it's big enough to host a deposit that could be very meaningful. We just intersected it in the wrong place. So with that news release, we had that, that cross section that showed we hit it uh, roughly 150 meters under the unconformity and we're targeting unconformity style. So where it meets the interception of 
the sandstone and the basement rocks is where we think that potential deposit could be. So it's you know moving our drill hole about 150 to 200 meters to the north and sort of doing the same thing over again, looking for that uh, interception, which could be our discovery hole. And you know that's where things get really exciting because you know with the grade and the size of these deposits, if you have a discovery hole for a junior company like us, I mean that is just an absolute game changer. It is huge results, like very early, uh, which is great. Um, and what is interesting from the fact that uranium isn't easy to find in the world, but in Athabasca, I mean, there's so much mining, there's so much going on there for decades, is that it's it's handy that you can look, because it is a lot of the same structure, and see it's similar to this, it's similar to this, it's similar to this. It doesn't mean it's exact. You know, I don't want people to think, oh, just because it looks this exactly the same, it's going to be. But it certainly is very, very good interpretations or at least a suggestion that you're onto things uh, whenever you've got so much data in that resounding area. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a key benefit for us. I mean, we've done that all the way through our systematic approach. I mean, we, we started big. We have a, a huge land package, but those regional surveys that we've done that you know check the initial boxes to say okay this is a target area worth following up on the advanced ground survey that again checking all the boxes of having a big deep seated structure there a graphitic corridor uh, a gravity low that's showing a lot of alteration in that area and now the drilling sort of again checking all those boxes again and, and backing up that information you know we continue to be motivated to continue to follow up these target areas. You know, sometimes you, you hear a, you know, drill it and kill it type story where you drill into a rock and you go, well, the geophysics said one thing, the geology is telling us something else, you know, we'd prefer to go to a different target and, and try that. You know, with this Appaloosa target, it's just continued to confirm, you know, best case scenario, to be honest, um, and has done everything but sort of hit that discovery hole. But again, the key thing for us now is, we know where to go with those next holes to, again, just exploration is all about doing everything you can using all the available data that you have to increase your probability of success. And, you know, with the data that we've now been able to gather, we just think, again, the odds of success just continue to rise for this target, which is the really exciting piece of it. Um, and, and again, excited to be able to uh, get back out there with a follow-up program that has the potential to make that discovery for us because again that's that's why we're out there is to make these discoveries so uh, a very exciting time and as far as uh it goes you know, in this space which is a challenging space the the junior mining if you've got a technical story that has hit uh a lot of these things that you want to see you always want that rather than say you know People may not have heard of stallion uranium or a marketing problem. That's a secondary problem that is uh, can, can be a luxury whenever you have good results. And so if you've got good results, this to some degree is a matter of just re like reminding people like, look, this is what we have. Uh, we're going to want in to get, get into the meat of this and get people excited about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got significant potential across the land package that we have. Again, we have 3,000 square kilometers in the Southwest Basin, neighboring, you know, next gen uranium energy company, uh, Denison, uh, F3 uranium, the other junior explorer that, that had the most recent discovery in the Southwest corner. So, you know, this is one target that we're calling, you know, tier one targets out of five or six target areas that we've discovered. And that's the other sort of aspect uh, that's even more blue sky for the stallion story is we think by showing the same systematic, you know, roadmap to discovery, we call it that, you know, we've proven that by putting our drill holes in the top, you know, 0.01% of our land package means they're going in incredibly good perspective zones. And we're seeing that with the Appaloosa results. I mean, it is, it's not easy to hit uranium um, targets and, and, you know, uh, anomalous radioactivity and, and we did that in 100% of our drill holes. And we think that, you know, tagging into the, the structure that we wanted to just further confirmed that those drills are in very good places. But again, we've got another five target areas that we think are just as good. And, and we're continuing to do some of the work to bring those along towards drill readiness as well. Um, but again, obviously, you know, near-term discovery is uh, first and foremost for a lot of people and, and for us as well. But 
even if we have that discovery, the ability to say, look, we followed this exact same roadmap, we could have another four or five of these on our projects um, is incredibly exciting. And again, as we continue to prove out that this model is working um, in our own hands, because I will say, you know, we're not recreating the discovery wheel here. We're doing exactly what all the other companies have done. So in my mind, it's already been proven out. And we're just, again, showing that it's a, a very good strategy to follow. Uh, but again, an incredible amount of excitement and upside potential, uh, because again, we think the Southwest Basin is where the Eastern Basin was in the 80s. You know, it's just just starting to see the exploration that the Eastern Basin saw 40 years ago. And, you know, we were fortunate just to step in at the right time and pick up a huge swath of very prospective land. And as you say, I'm a big follower of Justin Hewn as well. I think, you know, this uranium pullback that we've seen is, is validated in a, as a consolidation from the huge run we had last year. And things are going to get exciting again. I mean, the fundamental story is not cooled off at all. It's grown week in and week out. And, you know, it's going to be an exciting time. And, you know, you, you be patient during these pullbacks. And when things start to move, you show people how much good work you've done over the last six months, nine months. And, you know, I think when you stack up the work that we've done in that last, you know, six month, nine month period, it's, it's incredible. So we're excited about the next stage because it will be exciting for us. And I mean, you hear in, uh, there's always key words you hear, like you hear like a world-class asset or a tier one. I hear that all the time, but this truly is like, if you look across the world, uh, everyone, in, whether you're in Australia, you're in Europe, you're in the States, they recognize Athabasca Basin, like hands down. They're like, that's like the grades, what you're getting there. This is literally world-class. You can actually use that phrase properly in this uh, area. And when you're looking for a tier one asset, once again, uh, to people who are trying to translate that, what that could mean, that's a big discovery. And that's what really turns heads. And that's what I like about this is that it's technical, uh, the work that you've done so far and early uh, that you've hit on, the fact that you can make a lot of uh, uh, comparisons uh, because it is relatively similar to some extent, the, the formations and the different discoveries. And there's so much data out there that it makes this uh, a great you know, asymmetric possibility here in a space that maybe we'll talk about a little bit more now uh, is really the future. I mean, this second uh, nuclear renaissance, if you want to call it, or, or era has, uh, it's it's here. I, I think it's going to be very hard to change the momentum of what that, that, what that means. Uh, I know that I think it's uh, September, uh, Kazata Prom will be coming out with some guidance. But even with guidance from there, the rift between Russia and the United States is not going to get better anytime soon. Uh, so there's, there's already things in place that are forcing uh, buyers to look to Western suppliers uh, at any cost. Unless they can't get it, then they can look to other places. So there's a case for uranium. And, and if you look at it from an R&D perspective of piling in money so that we can get the level and amount that we're going to need if you want to make a dent in any of these kind of climate uh, big goals that we have. No, absolutely. I, I agree with you across the board there. And I think, you know, the important thing for us uh, in the Athabasca Basin is, again, world class. We are the highest grade uranium deposits anywhere in the world by a country mile. But that's even more important with the bifurcation of the uranium supply with, you know, the Russian uranium ban the build out of the whole fuel cycle. So right from, you know, yellow cake all the way through to nuclear fuel that's used in the reactors. And that's coming to the United States. And, and yes, there will be, you know, mandates to buy US uranium and, and those projects are starting to come back on, but not in the amount that's needed. And that's where you see, you know, the big pounds that can come out of the Athabasca Basin. And trust me, the United States will be looking to Canada as that nearshoring neighbor to supply this critical mineral. And I think the other just key aspect to this is, you know, it's, you know, I've been in the commodity space for, for well over a decade and, you know, it's always, you know, high prices, you know, seed the sort of next boom of a commodity, but this is not, you know, a crop of wheat where wheat prices shoot up and, you know, next spring, the farmers go out and plant a pile of wheat and next fall, the price of wheat is incredibly low because there's an oversupply. You know, this is a multi-decade cycle and 
the benefit is as we build up the new nuclear demand, whether that's SMR or you know the life extensions or new reactors getting built out, we could have uranium go from you know eighty-five dollars a pound today to two hundred and sixty dollars a pound, you know three x four x from here, and it's not going to have the same you know impact on the end consumer. Like when that gas prices go from two dollars to ten dollars you notice it on your power bill within months and, yeah. and you don't have that sort of impact. So again, you have an inelastic demand with these big projects where the end consumer is not feeling it. So, you know, everything is there to allow the commodity price to go high and stay high in order to incentivize, you know, new production to come online. And it has to, you know, trickle all the way down to the, the front end, you know, stallion is at the very front of that supply pipeline. And if prices aren't high enough, that front end supply isn't there. Like it hasn't been over the last decade, which is why we're in the situation where we are now, where there isn't any meaningful supply to come on uh, over the next couple of years. And then, you know, when some of the bigger projects do start coming on uh, towards 2030, then again, you're sort of eating through a lot of the mine supply that's already uh, in processing right now. So there's the need for a lot more uranium to come. And I think that's a very good thing for us in the world as it is a clean energy source. Um, but we need to do the work now, uh, as we see, you know, next gen energy, I remind people, it was a decade ago, almost exactly beginning in 2014, they found their discovery. They were a $25 million, you know, exploration company like Stallion is now. And, you know, 10 years later, they're trying to bring a mine into development and $6 billion. Yeah. But that's taken 10 years as well. So, you know, we need to make these discoveries now because there is a process to, you know, efficiently, uh, safely uh, bring these uh, pounds to the market. So that's why we're out there doing the work we're doing and, you know, are incredibly excited about it. Uh, not only is it, you know, a very lucrative thing uh, economically, but again, just from a high level saying we need this, you know, we, we need uh, that energy security, both uh, for Canada and the United States, and as a globe, more clean energy. So a very exciting sector to be in, to say the least. It's great to be able to be in, in a sector where, yes, there's huge potential for upside for making money, but you're part of a bigger cause. You're being part of the solution. And that always feels good, too, because it isn't just, you know... Uh, uh, I'm going to pick on Raytheon. I'm selling weapons to, <laughs> for war. You're like, that. yeah, you can make money on that, but may not feel so good about what you're, you're investing in. This is something where you get to invest in Canada, for one, which is a resource country, uh, and, and providing a huge growth in GDP, but in solving a lot of these emission problems. And uh, that is, is always a good double win as well for people. Absolutely. And, and for the country of Canada, you know, we are a resource rich country. Um, and, you know, that's not something to be ashamed of. The world needs it. And we're, you know, always at the forefront of how do we best uh, extract these resources? Um, you know, it's either going to come from us or it's going to come from other countries that don't have that same level of care and prudence that we have. And it still hits the global marketplace. So, you know, if we can do it in a way that is beneficial to our country and beneficial to the globe, you know, I think we have, you know, every uh, need to to do that and pursue that. And, and that's what we're doing. And again, I think, you know, that allows Canada to be a, a leader, not only in, you know, uranium resource extraction, but the whole fuel cycle. I mean, in Canada, we're vertically integrated with our uranium fuel cycle all the way through to the Candu reactors uh, that help power this country. And, you know, as you have more abundant, you know, efficient, uh, affordable power, the rest of the economy can flourish. Uh, and, you know, that's something that I think we could benefit from in, in Canada with, you know, dropping productivity rates. But um, again, it's exciting to be part of that. Like you say, it's part of a much bigger picture. Um, and, you know, I, I really see it as, as a necessity. Uh, you know, we're doing the work that has to be done. Otherwise, you know, five years, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we're up shit creek without a paddle, I'll put it nicely. <laughs> yes, it's something that I, I, you know, I look at should have happened five years ago, but listen, it started. Uh, and, you know, like yourself, I look at it as being well, most of my job is education to get people not only interested, feeling comfortable and then excited that uh, we're, we're blessed to be sitting in this country that has these resources. 
where Canada, not just in talk, but can literally stand up and be like, we are the drivers. We're that foundation of providing, in this case, the, the, the fuel for the, the uranium side of things, but whether it's graphite, copper, you, you name it, uh, you know, phosphoric acid, all of these things are here in Canada that we can, you know, we can supply. And that kind of foundation is massive that we should feel proud of. And I think once that message gets out and people feel like, well, how can I be part of a solution? Well, this is one way you can invest in the R&D side or those that are finding the assets to develop that become the fuel that we're going to need to grow, whether it's the AI data centers or, or whatnot. Uh, all of this is going to require incredible amounts of energy, and uh, we can do it, like you said, in a clean and, and responsible manner, especially if we do it here in Canada and the West, because if, if we choose the not in my backyard, it doesn't work. We already know it doesn't work. The world is connected. Uh, if some way, if we just close our eyes and go do it somewhere else, uh, I, I don't like those odds. I like that if we have it in our control over our oversight uh, with you know with proper regulations, that's a much better scenario for us and the world. Exactly. If we say you know not in my backyard, that just means likely a third world country says. OK, we'll do it and, and we'll do it without any of the regulations in place. And, and I think you touched on something important there is to say, you know, we should be we proud of it and support it. And, you know, how do you, you do that? You take part in it. You know, we are you know, a publicly listed company. And when you are a shareholder and investing in a vision of what a company is doing, you have a sense of pride rather than having you know, people that look at the extractive industries in Canada and feel you know shame and oh we shouldn't be doing this and and I think that's a mindset that really needs to to change and I think you know is changing um, but again that we are very fortunate here in Canada not only have the extractive industries and the resources but also the financial side of it where you look at the Toronto Venture Exchange one of the exchanges globally that helps fund uh, these you know com or companies that are doing the initial work and the early work that really the, the global supply chain needs. So uh, when you have people that are, you know, taking pride in, you know, the Toronto Manager Exchange and the companies that are on it and the work that they're doing, it's a shift in mindset that I think is going to be able to benefit everybody. And, you know, when we're out uh, at conferences, talking to shareholders or prospective shareholders, I think it, it is exactly that, having them excited to be part of your story and what you're doing um, and again, fortunate that especially in the uranium side, you know, there is a lot of uh, backing for that now. We're seeing people really uh, come up and want to support that narrative. So it is, you know, incredibly exciting. There's always, you know, uh, better ways to continue to do things and, and, and we'll see where things go. But again, on the uranium side of things, fundamentally just hasn't looked better. You know, the work that we're doing projects specifically is just so exciting. We continue to move our projects along at a very rapid pace. Uh, always have to give a hat tip to our technical team for that. I put them through the ringer and, and definitely uh, throw a lot of work at them, but they're more than able. And again, just as excited about the work that we're doing uh, as I am. So it's a very exciting time and uh, love to see what's been happening and just can't wait to make a discovery because that's going to be uh, an absolute game changer and a, and a whole lot of excitement. Well, we're looking forward to it as well. It was great to talk to you. Drew Zimmerman, CEO of Stallion Uranium. Thanks so much for joining us. And we're going to keep an eye out for you and see what any news flow coming out is. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me on and uh, great to be back. Take care.